Zambia is facing an energy crisis arising from the drought that has affected various sectors of the economy. The country's power utility applied to the Energy Regulation Board, ERB, two weeks ago to effect an emergency tariff adjustment that would enable it to raise $15 million to help with power importation. Well, the application was approved on Thursday by the Regulation Board and will take effect on 1st November 2024. ERB Director General Elijah Stone is on the program this evening to explain the rationale behind the tariff adjustment. You're watching Sunday interview with me, Grivazo Zulu. Remember, you can participate by calling us on 25-30-25. And also remember that we are live on our Facebook page, ZMBs Today, and you can leave a message there to participate in the program. Engineer Stone, welcome to the program. Thank you, Gravazio. Thank you for having me, and uh, good evening to you, and good evening to the viewers. Now, let's start. I know we, we are discussing the adjustment of, of electricity tariffs by Zesco, but there's an urgent matter on the table concerning your portfolio, and that is fuel. Uh, erratic supply of fuel, especially petrol, on the market. What has caused this? Thank you very much, Gravazio. <coughs> the issue really is that of a logistical challenge and uh, just to let you know that uh, for diesel 80 percent of diesel comes through the pipeline which is tazama the remaining 20 percent is by road in the case of petrol all of it 100 percent it comes you know via the road now in terms of transportation from Beira or indeed South Africa, where the petrol or diesel may be coming from, logistically there have been some changes. In one of our neighboring countries, there's a requirement now from the customs perspective in terms of the transit cargo to pay at a point of entry, at a port of entry, 24,000 US dollars. And then you get back your 24,000 US dollars at a port of exit. Now, that can take time for you to be able to get back what you need to. So what has happened is that uh, we were coming or having our trucks coming through via Zimbabwe uh, from Beira, for instance, to Lusaka. The distance is 1,060 kilometers. But now because of this challenge, they are having to use Chanida the total distance comes to about 1,550. So you can see that it's basically a half increase in terms of the distance. But also, Chirundu border post is a much bigger border post, and uh, the operation hours are more than what is the case at Chanida. Chanida only operates up to 18 or 19 at most. So. This is what has led to this logistical challenge, you know, in terms of uh, having a continuous uh, process of making sure that we do get the tankers, we do get the fuel into the country in a timely manner. So that's a logistical challenge that we are, we are facing, and because of that logistical challenge, uh, hence it has manifested in terms of the shortage of some of the products. But, but, but I, mean, I mean, this is just one border point that has suffered um, uh, 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 interruption. And we've got, um, like, a major disruption to our supply chain. Isn't that worrying? It is worrying, but uh, it is stabilizing in the sense that uh, we are working with other government agencies, I including ZRA, uh, just to make sure that we try and address some of those bottlenecks at the border post. So right now, I think the situation has improved. We, we, we have the flows you know, coming in. For instance, at Chanida itself, it used to be load shedded. And uh, Zesco was approached, and the border post now is no longer being load shedded. Uh, ZRA itself is also prepared to consider extending the hours of operations, but obviously there has to be mutual agreement on the other side. So processes are basically st being streamlined, and we're hoping that improvements can be done. We do have the other border post in Akonde, and just to let you know that uh, we did send our own officers to go on the ground to just try and monitor what's happening so that if there are any bottlenecks, they can identify those, but also engage with the other uh, players at the border post. And uh, we've gotten reports, and we will be engaging just to try and see to it that we smoothen the supply chain. Because what we need for the fuel sector is a reliable, 
continuous supply chain and that's how you know the sector operates well as, as a, this has taken long for you to stabilize it's getting into four it's getting into five days for some uh, for some towns and, and cities to normalize yes gravels it logistics can 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 be a challenge uh, but what is important is uh, you know the measures are in place right now and uh, we're very confident that in the next one week uh, the problems that we've been experiencing as a country uh, will be smoothened out uh, it's it's something that was uh, unplanned for sudden and uh, for any unplanned uh, events of this nature it takes a while to stabilize but we've done everything possible to make sure that uh, the bottlenecks are resolved in the shortest possible time people are concerned how much fuel do we have in the country again i just want to assure members of the public and the nation at large that this country has adequate stocks of fuel uh, the last time that we basically did the national count, we had, for instance, 37.1 million liters of diesel. That's what we had against the daily demand of 3.8 million. So you can clearly see we've got 37.1, and then we've got a national demand on a daily basis of 3.8. So in terms of the stock cover for that, you know, it's almost close to 10 days, you know. And when I say 10 days, and this is perhaps a misunderstanding that has been out there, 10 days is just meant to say this is the cover the country has. But as I said, the supply chain is continuous. So on daily basis, we keep on getting fuel being pumped in by Tazama, that is diesel. We also keep getting on part of the diesel and all the petroleum being brought in by road, road transport. So the 10 days is just the cover at that point in time to say, you know, if you look at what is in the country and what it will take to, you know, rep to finish or replenish, it's uh, 10 days. So people shouldn't uh, mistake this to mean that uh, after 10 days then we'll have no fuel. No, it's a continuous supply chain. And every day we are getting in fuel. Isn't it ironic that we've got that much of diesel, as, as you say, that much of fuel in the country, but then service stations don't have it? Yes. That and Spread across the country. Correct. Livingston, Kitwe, Lusaka, Solwezi. Co correct. You can continue counting. Sure. So, so part, part of the logistical challenge also is in country as well as uh, in terms of the imports. And, and rem remember, when fuel is brought into the country, you know, then it has to be transported to the various parts of the country. So that, that process, that supply chain was disturbed, and that's the one that we are now working very hard to try and stabilize, you know, so that we no longer have those pockets. Now, I can give you statistics. We do have uh, 614 feeding stations, you know, in this country. 614 feeding stations in this country and uh, just just today you know we we did a count based on the reports that we have collected because we do have a national stock monitoring system we had 71 percent of the feeding stations that we are sp spot checked today having both diesel and petrol then the other 25 percent had either one of the two products. And only 4% had been stocked out. In other words, they did not have diesel, they did not have petrol. So, so clearly, there are some pockets, but given these statistics, and generally that's been the trend over the past one week or so, 70% of the filling stations in the order of 418, they had products. But yes, you do get those pockets here and there, but the whole thing is that in the, within the next one week, we are very determined to ensure that uh, the logistics Everything stabilizes. Yes. Are all marketing companies mandated to keep a certain threshold of fuel as reserves? Uh, Gravazio, it, it used to be the case until the particular SI was uh, 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 abolished, so, so to say. And uh, what I can simply say is that uh, the country is now looking at uh, how best we can address the issues of strategic stocks. Uh, I'm happy to also inform the nation that uh, the government obviously has uh, put in place or introduced the National Energy Fund. 
and part of the process of that fund is also to try and uh, you know have strategic stocks now for strategic stocks the way the sector works is that uh, you can compel the OMCs to keep a certain minimum number of days 15 is what you you know or what we used to know as as a, as a figure and of course there's a cost to it so you need to make sure that in your price build up you make sure you take care of that then there's also stock that is supposed to be in the strategic reserves so what constitutes the security of supply is the operating stocks depending on the number of days that is prescribed and then you have the national you know, reserves so part of this energy fund you know the proceeds of which could also be used for for the strategic stocks and as you are aware, depots have been built throughout the country, so it's just a question of stocking those those depots. Currently, they're, unst they're, they're unstocked. Well, they are, they are stocked with uh, products, but maybe not necessarily the products belonging to the strategic stocks. But these are being used now, even by you know the oil marketing companies at this point in time. So the depots are being used uh, to some extent, uh, but not necessarily stocking the strategic stocks. But again, like I said, it's work in progress. And there is agency being attached to it because we need to make sure that uh, at any point in time we are secure in terms of uh, petroleum products in the country. So you're sure, before we move on to Zesco and, and, and tariff adjustments, you're sure there's no protest among the oil marketing companies protesting the price that you've set for this month as being unrealistic and uh, unreasonable, and probably speaking with their feet, not moving and making sure you understand that the cost is not cost reflective? Absolutely not. You know, we've adopted a very transparent pricing methodology. The price is dictated by what happens in terms of uh, the international oil prices. It's also influenced by the exchange rate. And uh, you may wish to know that uh, the international oil prices were favorable. In fact, they, they basically came down and our inflation uh, uh, or let me say the exchange rate was also stable and for those parameters they necess necessitated that we have a, a, reduction. a reduction yes so it's got nothing to do with uh, the protest as some quarters may be insinuating uh, i can assure you that uh, we do talk to the oil marketing companies we do engage as and when there's absolute need to review any aspect of the pricing uh, that is something that the uh, board considers with uh, all transparency. Oh, yes, yeah. So you're sure they're not protesting. Let's move on no. and, and get to the issue of um, electricity tariffs. You announced on Thursday the approval of the application by Zesco to adjust tariffs. What was the application about? Quickly run us through so that we, we get to understand. There could be a few people that haven't really gotten to exactly what Zesco wanted and what you have given them. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, Zesco essentially, as you are aware, when the when the the, the, the the drought was declared and and when Zesco itself applied for the declaration of emergency, the country had a deficit of 700 megawatts. As you and me talk right now, we're talking about that deficit having increased to 1,300 megawatts. But we also know that uh, financially, you know, Zesco to be able to import you know the electricity the tariffs at which the electricity is being imported is more than what zesco is charging you know its its customers so naturally there is a deficit even in terms of revenue and part of this applications uh, uh, purpose was to ensure that zesco is given additional revenue to be able to bring in the inputs that could bridge the deficit that we have so that was basically the essence of that particular application but added to that was the fact that this time around for this application zesco also guaranteed uh, the the hours of supply and and as you know it's basically seven hours meaning that will be load shed for 17 hours and they will have seven hours of, of supply but also this tariff adjustment is such that it does not target the low income you know uh, uh, households it also does not uh, target the small and medium enterprises and what do i mean by that for the first band of the residential tariffs for instance actually zesco reduced you know from 
44 ngwe per unit to 35 ngwe per unit. That's a reduction of 20%. So that's the first 100 units. The next 100 units, which were supposed to be at 105, they also reduced by 5% to one kwacha you know, per, per unit. And then for the commercial, uh, the commercial, these are the barber shops, saloons, and, uh, you know, maybe small-scale welders, and they also reduced by 15% for the first band and did not increase the second and third bands, but just increase the, the higher bands, which is band number four. So that's, that's how this uh, tariff was designed. It's not targeting the low income. It's not targeting the, the medium, uh, you know, SMEs, uh, but it is at the same time persuading those that uh, consume, you know, higher than 500, persuading them to look to for alternatives. More. Yes, to, to look for alternatives. They pay more. And uh, in paying pushing more, them off the grid so they could look for alternative sources. That of is by, the idea by giving them punitive tariff. No, it's an incentive, Gravazio. That's how I take it because that's an incentive for them to basically move to alternative energy sources, being solar and also even gas itself. So it's an incentive to do that and also to be energy efficient. So let, let's look at. I, I was reading your in the, the initial application and the current one. August, Zesco brought an application to you and rejected it. They brought another one in October. Basically, what they're asking for is the same as they asked for last time. So why did you reject the, the, the initial application? What has changed? You probably caused what has happened now. We're, we're in a crisis because of probably ERB didn't react at that point to give Zesco what they asked for. I know that they'd, uh, one of the reasons they gave was that they wanted to uh, aim to import 300 megawatts power during the time Mamba was going to be offline mm. and uh, they actually wanted to cover for the planning of the shutdown of the Caribbean North Bank. These were very valid reasons. And we went through the shutdown of Mamba, one of the lines on, on Mamba, because without that ap approval for the application and, and we had no power. ERB was at fault then, I, sh I should say. Only to come and approve now. What has changed? Well, a lot has changed, and uh, first and foremost, uh, I did indicate earlier on that uh, that particular tariff meant that uh, nothing was going to change in terms of the load shedding. Uh, so there was no guarantee in terms of uh, the hours of load shedding. There was going to be no change, so to say. But by the time we finished considering that tariff uh, adjustment, a lot of assumptions had also changed. And assumptions in the sense that uh, it was our assessment that uh, with that tariff application, Zesco was highly unlikely going to raise the revenue which they, they, they had wanted. But remember, the decision was not that Zesco did not need the adjustment. The decision was that Zesco needed support beyond the tariff measure. And what did we mean by support beyond the tariff measure? We said, let's look at other ways and means of assisting Zesco. Uh, they were highly unlikely going to meet the revenue requirement purely because of suppressed demand. If you remember, by the time we were making that decisions, uh, hours of load shedding had actually increased, you know, from 12 to about, uh, is it 15, 17, and... 21 and, hours. Yeah, 21 hours. Nothing has changed much, really. No, now things are going to change. Remember, this tariff takes effect from first of November, but at the same time, I think right now, uh, we, we're getting uh, three hours. That's my understanding. In fact, some are even getting more than uh, you know, three hours. But what Three hours is still a suppressed um, uh, kind of consumption. And Zesco still can't raise that amount of money. Have they given you another option as to how they're going to raise? And initially, they had asked for $14 million. You rejected that. Now they want $15 million, and you've, you've agreed to that. Yes. And... Uh, Part of the decisions, in fact, if you read one of the directives, the d directive is saying that we need to look at other ways and of raising, you know, finances, uh, prudent ways that would not cost much to the utility. And uh, indeed, what has happened is that other players have also been brought into, you know, play. Uh, we've got the uh, traders that are also assisting. Uh, and remember, we've got an open access uh, policy right now. So you are free, even as a consumer, 
you know, or uh, if it is a mining company, for instance, to go and, uh, you know, look for power, you know, anywhere else where they, they think they could get the power, you know, cost effectively. So that, those are some of the arrangements that are in place. But also, remember, we've also got the energy fund, and, and, and part of the initial rejection also was that uh, the National Energy Fund could also contribute to meeting ZESCO's uh, uh, requirements. And I think those processes have since been, uh, you know, effected. And uh, so it was not just a rejection to say ZESCO, you know, didn't need any, any, any revenue. We recognize that and uh, this particular tariff application is such that they've guaranteed that uh, they will have seven hours, you know, of supply to their consumers. But at the same time, what they want to raise in terms of the imports or the power that needs to be brought in, there will also be other players that can assist. And there are other innovative ways that are being used this time around to try and assist ZESCO at very or no cost to ZESCO itself. So come 1st November, power supply seven hours consistent. The decision of the ERB is... Uh, based on that. Is based on that. And uh, we expect ZESCO... And then we know that you are unable to regulate ZESCO on, on that score. Far from... They can, they can wake up one morning and give everybody else four hours or two hours or three hours of power or no power at all for 24 hours and you're not going to regulate them and check them. That's far from the truth, Gravazio. I think Zesco is, is, is one of those companies that we regulate and they take our decisions very seriously. And in particular, this time around, the board has issued a very specific directive to them in terms of making sure that the uh, load management schedule is adhered to. And where there are challenges in terms of uh, a supply, let them endeavor to inform the concerned consumers almost in a timely manner, if anything. They, 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 they've, they've abandoned that schedule before, and you're sure now just because of the directive that you've written and a statement they're going to obey that? They will obey that, and uh, that's why we're saying any time when they are challenged, because there are times when there are technical challenges beyond their control, or what they need to do is just to inform you know, the nation or the consumers that this is a case. Of course, the ERB would, would also have to be informed. And just for your information, we do also have a key performance indicator framework with uh, ZESCO. So we try to link this particular framework as well to the tariff determination. So if they don't perform very well, then, you know, the, there is uh, some kind of what you would call as carrot. Now, I'll come back to those. Let me get in the caller. Remember, you can take, up, take part in the program by calling us on 253025. Dr. Proud from within Lusaka, you are welcome to yeah. the program. Please go ahead and uh, make your contribution. First of all, happy customer day, Gravazio, and your management at ZMBC. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, Dr. Proud, right now I'm in the garden. Uh, good morning, Honorable. What is the name of that person, Gravazio? That's, uh, we have hosting engineer Stoney. He's the director general for ERB. First, in a, what we want as a person, we want to consistent power. For example, me, I'm living in a garden where people, they do make a block. Uh, so if you can work with Zambiame, Zambiame, there is a people of land. To, when, you know when they are going in war, they are going to put a this where it can't happen. As long as you are going to leave this issue of war, these people got a degree at the energy there. They don't implement the policy of the Republican president, including other issues, what we want to vulnerable. In our compound where I live in the garden, there is a vandalism of stealing cable of Zesco. So continue to remove all the copper one, bring that aluminium, including make a patrol. Thank you very much, Kerevazio. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for being brief. Um, I think you got that point. Yes. Uh, yeah, but as, as, as you think through and, and process it, I want, I want to take you back to your reasons why you rejected the initial uh, application. And one of them was unintended consequences that include inflationary pressure and increase in production cost, no guarantee of imports, slow switch to alternative power. These reasons still exist now. And I'll take you back to the inflationary pressure one. And somebody says the fact that you've exempted the lower uh, segment of the population doesn't necessarily mean that they will not suffer from these inflationary costs that will come as a result of 
increased cost of production because the exemption then is going to be wiped out. Gravazio. Because the, the, the companies that manufacture things and produce and provide the services will increase their prices. Then the 20% will not really make much sense. What, what I can tell you is that uh, when the board makes this kind of determination, it's a, it's a balancing act. Uh, remember, you have uh, competing you know, objectives. And what you need to do basically is to say, how do we balance all these, these requirements? The bottom line that I can tell you is that uh, when you don't have power, and we did a study way back as ERB in 2017, you know, the lost load for the small and medium enterprises was 95 US cents per lost load. So what am I talking about? All I'm saying is that uh, the cost of not having power or the, the impact of load shedding is more expensive than expensive power. So there are trades of, you know, of course there will be inflationary pressures, there will be, you know, these other, you know, effects. Ultimately, what you want is to make a decision that in the end, you know, uh, is for the benefit of, of, of the nation. Because energy is the lifeblood of any economy. And, and once you don't have it, uh, then it's, it's going to be very difficult for, for this country to run, or indeed for our lives to continue going on. So all I can tell you is that it's a balancing act, and that's how it's, it is. You know, you want cost-reflective tariffs. At the same time, you want affordability. At the same time, you want to have access. And all these are kind of competing, and then you have to make sure that you balance them out. So th those impacts that were there then are still there, but uh, you know you have to have a bigger picture, and I think that's what uh, informed the board in terms of making the decision which was done. Mm -hmm. Having power, expensive as it may be, is better than having no power at all. 25-30-25 is a line you can call if you need to participate in the program, and we are hosting the Director General for the Energy Regulation Board, Engineer Elijah Stone. So you're looking at talking about giving relief to people that consume less than 200. Uh, uh, kilowatts. What numbers are we looking at? How many people will benefit from this? For those that consume, say, in the order of uh, up to 200 or, or so, those that are targeted uh, under this particular tariff is 56% of Zesco's customer base. That works out to be in the order of 730,000 you know, consumers. So that's, that's, that's the number that we are looking at. Let's, let's get in Charles Mson, Charles Mson from Kawe. Charles, you're through the program. Please go ahead and ask your question. In fact, it's not a question, Clavazio. It's a comment. I Please just want to, 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 to talk about the security of, uh, of Zesco. You know, there is, there is a problem. Once uh, you add the uh, thieves who have uh, stolen cables there and there. So you mean the Zesco cannot find a way of... Uh, even to put the security guards uh, patrolling the places because they are losing and that impact is coming from us as co consumers. That's where my concern is. Hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a comment, Thank but I don't know if you can take it on behalf of Zesco, it, providing security to ensure that the, co the losses that Zesco is suffering as a result of thefts is not passed on to ash consumers. Zesco is best place to answer, but one would also comment because remember one of the things that we seek to do is to ensure that there's security of supply. And uh, obviously vandalism itself is a big concern to, to, to us as a regulator because for that equipment it would have to be replaced and for the equipment to be replaced then Zesco would have to come back to the ERB and uh, ra request for funds to be able to replace that. So vandalism indeed is a, a great concern and I think it is basically tantamount to economic uh, sabotage. Uh, we do know that uh, Zesco has put in place some measures and that some of the installations they do have uh, cameras you know that uh, assist in aiding security and uh, obviously I think they are doing much more and at an opportune time I'm sure they will share with the public as to what exactly is happening. But we are aware that uh, certain installations, they do have security cameras 
and uh, the extent to which they would uh, policy each and every installation, I think that's something that perhaps Zesco would be blessed, best placed to answer. But uh, we are extremely concerned because, you know, supply will be disturbed and in the end, uh, these people who do these things are within our communities, so somehow they are known. And uh, our appeal is that uh, let's report them to the relevant law enforcement agencies and protect the Zesco equipment because it's meant to save all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, bigger question, yeah. When people pay pay more, let's get in uh, Nevers Musonda from Kawa before I ask my question. Uh, Nevers, go ahead and ask your question. Nevers, good evening. You are through the program. Good evening, Grivaldo. Good evening, Mr. Sichoni. Good evening to you, sir. Um, I'm Kefas Musonda, an advocate for industrialization and international development. I have uh, only two questions for you. Number one, you are talking about VESCO, uh, realizing their finances so that they can uh, run well in their business. Why are you not considering subsidizing the fuel so that the small entrepreneurs during this crisis they can afford to run genset so that their businesses may also continue? Number two, how far have we gone with the realizing the dream of uh, bringing back Tazama, uh, Tazama, which is the, uh, you're using the Tazama pipeline in terms of the transportation of uh, crude fuel to Ndola? I, I feel it's cheaper than using uh, uh, railway or road transport. Those two need the very critical understanding and analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr. Msonda. Uh, the issues around uh, fuel subsidies, and unfortunately, I think it's a matter that is best placed and best dealt with by the Minister of Energy. Uh, the current policy is that uh, we need to be cost reflective, I think, in the way we price our energy resources, uh, be it uh, fuel or indeed uh, uh, electricity. Uh, there is always a way in which the targeted support can be done, but I think that's a matter that has to be thought through and uh, again, we only do that which is uh, given to us uh, by the government by way of the policy you know, direction. So at the moment, we're just following the policies and uh, I'm, I'm sure I, I would take note of this uh, request and uh, challenge it through the Ministry of Energy you know, for due consideration. Now, the second part of your question was to do with Tazama. I can confirm that Tazama indeed is uh, pumping uh, the diesel from Dar es Salaam up to Ndola, and uh, Tazama is doing very well in terms of pumping. I think it's uh, operating at efficiencies uh, never seen before. So we are getting 20% of our diesel right now, you know, through Tazama at a cost that is almost uh, like 25% of what it is like transporting diesel, you know, by, by road. So the, the Zambian people are getting the benefit of that, and uh, I think uh, the government is again looking into possibility of having a second line, so that uh, hopefully we can have almost all our diesel, you know, 100 percent, you know, coming so in. So it's by a time. time. Yeah. There's a Mr. Chidesha on the line. Uh, get through to the program, Mr. Chidesha. Go ahead and ask your question. Good evening, engineer Stone. Good evening, sir. Um, I want to do to take note of the filling stations. Some of them are substandard. They don't have the air pressure. The whole country, like with the South, I want to find them at Puma. The majority of these you know, filling stations do not have. Number two, I want you to answer the subsidizing of fuel so that the common man can have a chance to have cheaper fuel. What is it that you have told to subsidize the fuel? Number three, I want you to have an interest in VESCO. VESCO is so highly technical. In terms of reporting port, it can take three hours while the house is going back to down. I've tried to raise this issue with VESCO, and uh, the road saving management is not properly done. I've raised this issue with the board chair. I think he engaged VESCO to be men with people. People are suffering. 
There's no way Lord Chedding can be taking 16 hours for four days. I complained to the board chair last time. Five days without power. When he intervened with us, the time power came. Look at the finishing of standard mesh. Look at, I want to answer also on the subsidizing of too well. What is it that you have told to subsidize too well? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chesha. He's got three points there. Yes, I think it's an issue of the substandard uh, filling station. Uh, just to let you know that uh, we do actually have a grading system for these filling stations and uh, we do spot checks. And uh, we will be happy for you to report, I think, any particular filling station that would be of concern. But of course, because of the load shedding, we've noted that uh, in, in, most, in some of the filling stations, all the services are not being offered. And I think... Uh, you know, air pressure is one that uh, you don't easily find, uh, you know, in nowadays. So we think that uh, this is a temporal uh, occurrence, given the challenges that the country is going through. But uh, if indeed these challenges persist beyond uh, the improved hours of uh, electricity supply, uh, please feel free to notify us and uh, we'll be happy to... Uh, pursue, uh, visit those particular filling station and bring our concerns to them. Uh, because we do have standards that have to be complied with and uh, we are very keen to enforce those standards. The issue of fuel subsidy has again uh, come up and uh, as I indicated earlier on that uh, we as a regulator can only implement government policy and I think the policy at this juncture is that uh, pricing of uh, energy should be cost reflective but uh, if there are any special means through which government can support, uh, we, we will channel this particular request to the Ministry of Energy uh, through which uh, you know, government can, can address that if at all there is anything. The issue around load management, uh, we do take note and I think that's why for this particular tariff uh, application, the directive by the board is very, very you know, clear. And it is our expectation as ERB, and we will be exercising regulatory oversight, you know, so that indeed Zesco sticks to the load, load management schedules. Where there are challenges, they will be expected in real time to be able to inform the consumers about the challenges that are being experienced by the system. Because at times there are faults that could be beyond them from a technical perspective. I think what is important is to communicate and also sensitize the consumers at any point in time. Let's get in Kelvin from Mikelen. Kelvin, um, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, sir. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good evening, sir. I have a few questions for the Yes. One question is that. Then in the opposition, we had an issue where the government suggested. Kevin, you're not very clear. Maybe you could you can call us again. Uh, we'll allow you to call back. Um, your line is quite poor, uh, quite bad, so we can't get what you're saying. So please call back. Uh, call back, and we'll accommodate you. So we we couldn't get uh, Kelvin from Ikeling. I think the line is quite bad. Let's get back to the question, bigger question. When people pay more, what do they get in return? I know there's seven hours. What else? Well, when they, when they pay more, obviously you expect that uh, Zesco will have uh, revenue to be able to import. And uh, when that power is made available, then you have uh, improved services from, from, from Zesco. So I think that's the whole essence of trying to raise that revenue. But also, I should add that, uh, you know, for those that consume more, they are persuaded or they have an incentive to try and switch to other alternative forms of energy, electricity being one of them. And also for cooking, for instance, they could also switch to liquefied petroleum gas, LPG. So th those are misunderstanding on the 200 kilowatts, uh, 200 units. In quacha terms, what do they translate to? When you say when you have 100 units and below, you get a discount, uh, 200 units and below, you, you get to pay less. In terms of kwacha, what are we talking about? Thank you very much, uh, Gravazio. 
as I indicated uh, earlier on, is that for the what we call the first category or the first band, R1. Uh, I just want you to hold your thoughts so that we don't delay the caller on the line. John Mwali, please go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, so my first question is um, regarding, w in terms of uh, the future, how long will it take um, for this crisis to be resolved? In other words, I'd like to know what time, what timelines there are regarding resolution of this particular energy crisis. What assumptions has ERB made uh, into 2025, and and uh, what mitigation measures have been put in place just in case, just in case we have this continued uh, drought into 2025. So I just want to get a, a sense of what the, the, the horizon has in terms of energy production for, for, for Zesco. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, usually making prediction at times when you're talking about uh, acts of God is, is, is not an easy undertaking. Uh, indications so far by those that uh, predict the rainfall, the meteorologist, is that uh, we are going to have uh, normal to above normal rainfalls. Uh, but we also do know that uh, it takes a while for the reservoirs to be replenished. So what one just hopes is that uh, once we have these normal rainfall patterns, uh, slowly but surely we will get uh, uh, to an improved situation in terms of the supply. Uh, in terms of the exact timelines, uh, I think it might be difficult for me at this juncture and on this platform to be able to give you, you know, timelines with certainty. Or what we just know is that uh, as the hydrology improves, as the rainfall pattern also improves, then we expect that uh, slowly but surely Zesco also generation capacity will be rebounding. Uh, but also going into the future, uh, we also know that uh, part of the solution to addressing the challenges that we are having is to also look at international trade. And uh, right now, uh, Zesco is working on interconnecting with uh, Tanzania, for instance. Uh, Tanzania, we know that uh, they've had uh, a good rainfall and uh, also uh, quite some capacity that could actually have been availed to Zambia had we had the interconnection between the two countries. Uh, we're also looking at uh, other regional interconnections uh, uh, through the Southern African Power Pool, that is Angola. Angola is also reported to have uh, excess capacity at the moment, so one hopes that we can also tap again the transmission systems uh, you know uh, allowing but also on the local level as you know there is also a push to try and diversify our sources of energy and in particular solar so as ERB we have also been approving a number of power purchase agreements to do with the development of solar and uh, this power purchase agreement previously used to take anything from 20 to 30 and now we're having to approve them within 48 hours so a, a quick turn around yes okay. yes Let, let's get in the caller before you continue mr muira from Mondola, are you still there please go ahead and ask your question yes, um, please ask your question yeah go, good evening good evening to you mr Muir. Uh, my is it just a comment which i would like to make to the israel of the person go ahead, yes sir. um i think uh, the ELB most of the time uh you are too theoretical. Um, looking at the statement which you gave, you said uh, when you buy electricity which is expensive, is better than the electricity where there is no electricity. For me, I think expensive electricity will affect a lot of people, and most of the people be losing their employment because those people in uh, production will reduce their labor force because they will be spending more on the production of goods and services. I think what you would have done as a regulator, you would have advised the school to find other alternative, quick solutions that can help the country. For example, the one you have told us at uh, solar, you can engage the private sectors to 
construct the solar plant so that immediately they start providing to the national grid than always relying on the import. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, thank you. So, 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 so just in terms of improving security of supply, we're also looking at other forms of energy. And uh, this country is also well endowed in uh, core resources. And as you are aware, Mamba Phase 2 is actually currently under development. So we expect another 300 uh, megawatts. Uh, I, we don't mean to be very theoretical. The, the point that I was trying to make is that uh, the impact of load shedding is quite devastating. And uh, what I was trying to say is that uh, you are better off having power to try and uh, uh, sustain you know, the economy than not having anything. So what I was saying is we, we need some power. And if that power is expensive, studies have shown that uh, the cost of actually having no power is more than the cost of expensive power. So that's a point that I was trying to make. And uh, as ERB, we seek to drive efficiencies. We want the utility, including Zesco, to be efficient. And uh, we will not pass on inefficiencies to the consumers. What we want is uh, the utility or any company that is licensed to be viable to earn a reasonable return, but at the same time provide affordable you know, services, in other words, in terms of cost. So it's, it's a, again a balancing act, mm -hmm. you know, so that uh, the companies are able to provide the service and that uh, customers also get those services at affordable you know, prices. So rest assured that uh, we are there to ensure that we extract as much as possible the efficiencies and not to pass any a necessary cost to the consumers and I think that's the ARB takes that work very seriously. I did ask you 200 units roughly when you take it to Kwacha how much does somebody spend? Uh, thank you very much Gravazi. As I indicated uh, in terms of this uh, tariff that the board has approved for the first band which is up to 100 which is R1 the reduction has been from 44 Ngwe per unit to 35 ingwe per unit. So if you are buying 100, then you'll be buying those 100 units instead of at 44, you'll be buying at 35 kwacha. The next uh, 100 units, they used to be at uh, one kwacha, five ingwe per unit. Mm -hmm. They've been reduced by 5%. Now it's one kwacha per unit. So what it means is that uh, for those 100 units up to 200, then you'd be buying them at 100 kwacha. So in terms of the total, if you're buying 200, then it's 35 plus 100, which is 135. Whereas at the old tariff, you'd actually have been paying uh, 149. Let's get in the caller. Robbie from Kalumbira, please go ahead and ask your question. Yes, good evening, Gravers. Good evening, Robbie. Yeah, uh, I have a contribution. Please go ahead. Uh, I just want to find out from... Uh, um, uh, sorry, I've forgotten uh, the name of the I other panelist. Engineer Stoney. Yes, Engineer Stoney. Uh, we have the Kabompo Hydro Power Station here in Northwestern province, uh, uh, to be specific, Kalumbira district. This is a project which was started a long time ago, but up to now, it doesn't come to fruition. What is uh, VESCO and ERB thinking about this? Because this is a region which receives, receives a lot of rainfall, and if this project can be complete... Robbie, we've lost Robbie. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you've got the gist. Yes, uh, <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, we, we, we do have within the Ministry of Energy the Office for Promoting Private Power Investment, uh, or triple PI. And uh, I think they do have all the sites, uh, you know, mapped out, you know, for, for, for investment. Uh, so at this point in time, we as a regulator do not necessarily deal directly with those, uh, you know, uh, potential sites. 
uh, only when it comes to the issue of licensing you know for development of those uh, particular sites uh, only then to do we get involved so i think uh, i would refer and uh, i'll be happy to take uh, the caller's uh, inquiry to the ministry of energy so that uh, the status could be provided on that particular site let's look at the directives that you've given zesco i know uh, some are saying they're very weak really they're not strong some of them not even tied tied to any uh, key performance indicators but i'll pick out one one of the directives which is very strong is operational efficiency measures and unfortunately this is coming after approval you've told zesco to give you submit a report on short term medium term and long term measures to improve efficiency shouldn't this have come before you approved the adjustment i think it's just enhancing the reporting on them so what has happened is that there is an agreement between the regulator and the utility in terms of those kpis so what the, that directive is saying that they need to be reported on uh, it's not that uh, this is the first time that a kpi framework is being introduced it is in existence already and i think what the board is basically asking for is that can we have reporting and also in terms of specific plans to make sure that uh, what has already been approved in terms of the kpi framework is implemented so when we look at other measures that you've given to zesco they're, they're not really strong what were they meant to achieve? I mean, one of them is just sensitizing the public. The other one is sticking to the schedule. And we all know Zesco will not stick to the schedule. We'll probably call you again here and ask you that Zesco didn't stick to the schedule. Uh, this time around, I hope that does not happen. But uh, sensitizing the public is very important because uh, you, they provide a service to the public. And I think it's incumbent upon them also as part of being a, a caring service provider to be able to ensure that uh, you know the public is sensitized sensitized in terms of how efficiently they should be able to uh, utilize the the services or products that are being provided to them and also you know paying attention to and attending to the complaints uh, you know as part of a good customer service just to also let you know that uh, we also do have quality of service and the quality of supply standards. So uh, again, uh, that is part of the outreach that we are talking about. Let people know and uh, you know, let people get the best of services. So it's, it's an obligation that any service provider ought to embrace. People expected you to ring fence the monies and the amount that they're going to collect. Let me answer these two questions. I know we're going to the end of the program. One, this is a three months emergency tariff. What happens after that? Do we revert back to the old tariffs, or do we continue with them? Yes, so first and foremost, to adhere to the load management schedules which uh, you know, they, are, they, they, they have undertaken uh, to, 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 to the people as part of this tariff application. Then in terms of the, what happens after three months, uh, what happens once the board de declares that the emergency is no more, we revert to the old tariffs. That's, that's a requirement. Engineer Stone, thank you so much for time. This is the run out of time. Thank you, thank for, you for coming. Thank you for having me, Gravazio, and uh, good evening to the viewers.